thank you, Fred, for that introduction. All the groups that he mentioned have done better after I left. Uh, <laughs> it's a strong group now. Um, I began writing this book uh, thinking about my grandchildren. We, uh, Cameron and I have six now, and I began asking myself, what kind of world are we really building for our children and grandchildren? And uh, what track are we on as a country? And, and, and if we're not on the right track, how do we change course? Uh, pretty basic questions that I'm sure you've asked yourself uh, often. And, uh, you know, and I think, uh, so I want to talk to you today about four imperatives that come out of the, uh, out of the book. Um, and one is the imperative of system change, maybe the most important uh, one of all. Because if you look at the trends in our country today, uh, you find that we are now, uh, have sunk to the bottom of a, a, a group of 20 advanced uh, democracies uh, in, in more areas than, than we care to think about, uh, 30. Uh, I, look, I identify in for the, for the purposes of the book. We have the highest poverty rate among all these countries, the greatest inequality of incomes, the least social mobility, that surprises a lot of people, this land of opportunity. Um, this won't surprise a lot of, uh, of the women. We have the worst score on the UN's uh, gender equality index, the worst. We have the worst score on the material well-being of children index. I won't, you know, we, we know we spend the highest proportion of GDP on health care, uh, but we also, you know, don't always appreciate that we have the highest infant mortality, the highest obesity, uh, the highest consumption of antidepressants, and the shortest life expectancy of all of these countries. Um, mm. We have uh, very poor scores internationally on uh, testing, uh, particularly in math, but also in reading and science. Uh, we have the highest homicide rate, the largest prison population, the most guns. Actually, Canada has more guns, but they don't kill nearly as many people. Uh, the highest carbon dioxide emissions, uh, the highest water consumption per capita, the lowest uh, score on the environmental performance index that the World Economic Forum uh, sponsors, uh, the largest ecological footprint uh, per capita. Uh, you know, we think of ourselves as being the most generous nation. We're at the bottom of the OECD's uh, major countries and in, in the portion of money we give to the of GDP that we give to development and humanitarian assistance. Uh, the highest military expenditures uh, by far, both uh, and and the largest international arms sales. So we're kind of number one in exactly all the ways we don't want to be uh, now. And uh, bottom line, I think, is that when you have problems emerging of such ferocity across the whole spectrum of economic and social and political and environmental life, uh, it can't be due to small reasons. Uh, it's because the system is failing us and giving uh, you know, basically, uh, we live and work in a, in a system, this operating system that our country runs on is delivering uh, terrible results. And if we want to really put ourselves on a different path, we've got to think about how do we change the system. And most of my talk today uh, will be uh, on that subject. And uh, in effect, we've got to drive systemic transformative change to the point that we actually have a new system of political economy. Uh, a system that routinely delivers good results for human and natural uh, communities. Um, I think the core of our problem in a lot of ways is uh, the forces that we've, uh, you know, that define this ruthless and rapacious brand of capitalism uh, that we have, uh, as well as a set of negative forces stemming uh, originally from the Cold War and now characterized by the what we call the national security state, which I'll also talk about. Uh, so in a moment, uh, I want to go through with you what I see as the key elements uh, of today's American capitalism and our national security state and the needed direction of change in these various uh, dimensions. And in the book, uh, I, I try to show how collectively uh, these dimensions of our capitalism and of the national security state end up giving priority to profit and growth and, and, and international power and the projection of it, uh, when what we really need is a system of political economy that gives priority to people and place and planet. So that's the first point that I want to make, is that we, 
live and work in this system of political economy is failing us and we need to concentrate. You know, we need a lot of incremental reform efforts. They need to continue, but we need to complement these efforts that reform and efforts that transform and efforts that changing the system fundamentally. And that leads to, to my second point, the second imperative, if you will, and, and that is we, we need a compelling vision of the future. Uh, you know, when syst system change does come, it does so because people, the people agitating for change have presented a, a positive picture of a future worth fighting for. And uh, the future's got to be attractive enough and plausible enough that people are willing to take the considerable risk of cutting loose from uh, today's reality, from the present, which people acknowledge is perhaps unworthy of us, but is the only world we really know. And what is the alternative? And uh, so I try in the book to present the world of 2050, the world that we could build uh, between now and then. And it's one of those things that, you know, fools rush in. Uh, but I do have a, a vision, I think, of uh, in the book of the world that we could build. We will have climbed out of the basement of the OECD on all those dimensions that I led off with. Uh, we would have headed off calamities that could detract us from doing any of these things, like climate change, or the most serious aspects of climate change. Uh, we will have actually experienced a deep transformation in values in the country, in our consciousness. Uh, and we will have opted for what might be called localization, um, a, a rebirth of community and rootedness and localism, if you will, uh, strengthen and, and benefiting from the best aspects of a sense of global citizenship and, uh, and, and those aspects of globalization. Um, thirdly, uh, you know, when change happens, it doesn't happen just because people have a powerful, positive vision of the future. It, it happens because they believe it can be realized, and, and they believe that we know enough uh, to get started uh, down the path uh, to an alternative uh, future. And they, people see the means to realize uh, the vision. And, and most of the book talks about uh, that and the, uh, the changes that we, uh, we need to make in, in various, uh, various areas. So, Basically, the third imperative is the imperative of, no, of knowing confidently how to, to move ahead. And, and most of the book, as I say, it is, it is focused on this, because what I think is the case is that uh, you know, we can achieve systemic change by driving a series of interacting, mutually reinforcing transformations. And these transformations are aimed at undermining the motivational structures of the, of the current system and replacing these old structures with new arrangements uh, that yield a sustaining economy and a successful democracy. Um, so what am I talking about here? Well, let me mention these areas to you. First, uh, in the market. Uh, we need to move from what we have today, an almost a laissez-faire situation in many aspects of, uh, to powerful market governance in the public interest from dishonest prices uh, you know, uh, across a broad front uh, due to externalities and perverse subsidies to, to honest prices uh, and, and from uh, commodification to protection of the commons. In the corporation, uh, we need to move from shareholder primacy to stakeholder privacy. Uh, from this one main ownership model that we have to new business models uh, that involve alternative forms uh, of ownership and really to the democratization of uh, capital. Uh, so we see more and more uh, uh, public enterprises, uh, public-private hybrids, uh, co-ops uh, of different types, and other forms of, uh, uh, of ownership uh, of capital. In money and finance, uh, to move from Wall Street to Main Street, uh, to revive local banking, to create state banks in all of our states. Um, and to move, and this is controversial, from uh, creating money primarily through bank debt uh, to creating money by government, which is what Lincoln wanted and did. Um, in economic growth, from our current uh, growth fetish uh, to a post-growth 
uh, society. So from mere GDP growth uh, to growth in human welfare and, and democratically determined priorities, uh, we have this growth fetish. Now, we'll talk about it in a, a moment. Um, I think it's a snare and a delusion. Uh, the country, since 1980, the economy of the United States has more than doubled, maybe, maybe gone up about 125% in real terms since 1980. So what happened when we had all this growth? Inequality mounted to the level of the 20s. Poverty grew to an all-time high. 42,000 manufacturing plants left the United States. Life satisfaction flatlined. Real wages flatlined. And the environment tanked to the point that we're on the cusp of losing the planet. Uh, and all that happened, you know, in the context of all this growth. So growth it doesn't deliver. And the idea that merely reviving the economy and ratcheting up GDP, which is what I mean by growth, uh, doesn't deliver. It doesn't work. And secondly, it deflects us from focusing on the things that we really need to grow. There are a lot of things that do need to grow. Jobs. Modern infrastructure, green technologies and energy and other things. We need to grow in lots of areas. Uh, but you know, the way to do it is not to assume that by high levels of GDP we're going to get those things. We've got to focus on public policy, on growing the things that we want to grow. And, and also, you know, this, this uh, current focus on growth basically empowers the banks and empowers the corporations. When we say we just want to ratchet up GDP, uh, we have to turn to these folks to get the job done. They're sitting on their money now, heavily. But um, in social conditions, the transformation from economic uh, insecurity to, to real security, from these vast uh, inequities and injustices that we have now to fundamental fairness, uh, from joblessness to you know, good jobs for everybody who wants to work. In indicators, we need to move from our you know, GDP Worship against the altar of GDP, that's, those of you who don't know, that's a grossly distorted picture. Um, to accurate measures uh, of social and environmental health and accurate measures of the quality of life. In consumerism, from our, uh, you know, in con our consumerism and uh, affluenza uh, to sufficiency and mindful uh, consumption. You know, from more to enough, knowing when we have enough, from owning to sharing. A friend of mine has a law casebook now called Sharing Law, uh, which is really quite complicated. The law of how people can share things, whether it's housing or machinery or other things. Um, in communities, from you know, runaway enterprises and throwaway communities to really vital local economies and, and rootedness and solidarity. Uh, in our dominant cultural values, the transformation uh, from getting to giving. Uh, from richer to better, uh, from separate to connected, uh, from apart from nature to part of nature. Um, your Senator Moynihan made a famous statement one time, which I think is appropriate. Um, he, he said the central, you know, conservatives always talk about the importance of culture and values. And he said, yeah, the central conservative truth is that uh, values and culture really do determine the fate of society. But he said the central liberal truth is that a society can change its values and can change its culture and save it uh, from itself. Um, if you look at this, and then finally, uh, in foreign policy and the military, from this idea of American exceptionalism to America as normal nation, uh, from hard power to soft power, uh, from militarization, militarization uh, to real security, and a new definition of uh, security and citizenship. Um, if you look at these dozen areas uh, where we can concentrate transformation, you know, you find a couple of things real quickly, and I did in, in writing the book. Uh, first, we know a lot about how to affect these transitions, these transformations in each of these areas. And secondly, there are a lot of people, if you add all this up, different organizations working uh, on these issues. Uh, and um, so there, it's not at all hopeless. We do know a lot about how uh, to move forward. And we have some great organizations and individuals uh, working for deep change in these areas. And the final uh, imperative is one that's 
you know, close to the heart of this organization, and that's the imperative of a new democratic uh, reality uh, in our country. Because uh, whether we are seeking incremental reforms, as most of us have done all of our lives, or we are really dedicated to deep transformative change in the system, uh, we're not going to get there, as Fritz was saying, uh, with today's politics and today's democracy. Uh, so we need to forge an agenda of pro-democracy reforms, uh, and I would, you know, thank uh, the Brennan Center and Michael Waldman, who I cite a lot in the book, uh, for a uh, you know, source of, of that agenda for democratic uh, change. You know, obviously, secure the vote, secure the voters, uh, undermine the power of big money, and shift power from corporations to people. Uh, you know, we're affected right now, afflicted right now, with a bad case of uh, uh, plutocracy and, and corporatocracy creeping uh, forward. And we've got to push back on that urgently. And, 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 you know, thanks to the work of the Brennan Center and others, we know a lot about what's needed uh, in these various uh, areas. So I want to stress two things about the political situation in particular. Um, unlike the forces on the right, the progressive forces are, in my judgment, badly fragmented, badly siloed, working on their own particular range of issues. And, uh, and I think as long as we stay that way, we won't be able to take advantage of the opportunities for, for real change. We won't be able to take advantage of this rising disenchantment in, in the public and, uh, or take advantage of the crises that will inevitably uh, come. So we need to bring progressives together to forge a common progressive identity in the country, uh, concerted efforts to institutionalize coordination, to form backbone organizations as this Studies suggest it is essential to cut across all these groups to build a common infrastructure capable of formulating <coughs> clear policy objectives and strategic messaging. And what has been more successful than the messaging of the climate denial machine? Mm -hmm. And it's been studied now. We know the players. We know how they do it. And and uh, when you get down, it finally gets down to the echo chamber where you uh, you hear the bloggers and the commentators on Fox and others uh, repeating this. Uh, uh, sowing of doubt uh, about uh, climate. Uh, the second thing is, that it seems to me inevitable, that, as, as Fritz was saying, that uh, real change is going to, will require uh, a rebirth of marches and protests and, and demonstrations and direct action and nonviolent civil disobedience. That, that can dramatize issues, uh, show the depth of public concern, uh, attract media attention, uh, build sympathetic support if it's done right. And one reason I like Bill McKibben a lot and, and what he does on climate issues and all, because he brings a sense of humor to this whole area of, uh, of protest and, and confrontation, if you will. He, one thing he wants to do is to buy the, um, all the members of, you know how the, uh, at NASCAR, uh, everybody has one uh, sort of a satin jacket with the logos of uh, STP and and all the companies that are supporting it. But he wants to buy one for each politician that has a, the logo of each of the uh, corporations that have bought into them uh, and are their sponsors. Um, I think it's lovely. Uh, but we do need to put it all on the line. And I think we've got to, in that sense, bring back, bring back the 60s and, and, and 70s. Um, um, I mean, if there's one moment in living memory that we need to be inspired by, it seems to me, it's the Civil Rights Revolution. And if we could bring that kind of determination and risk-taking into what we've got to do now, uh, we'll be much better off. Um, so is there a theory of change that makes sense in terms of these deep issues? Well, let me tell you what I, what I believe is the case. The first is that enough people have to come to to these three basic conclusions. That there's something profoundly wrong with the political economy. And, uh, and the second that follows from that, uh, that is that we need to, to change the system, the imperative of system change and building a new political economy that routinely delivers good results, routinely, automatically, hardwired to deliver good results for people and place and planet. And the third conclusion is that, you know, contrary to what we are often told that a better alternative does exist. And uh, we don't understand all the details, but we know enough to start building it, to strike out on that, that road. Well, these aren't 
the conventional wisdom today, these three conclusions, but I would argue that more and more people are coming to them uh, and that they are the foundation uh, on which the work of system change can go forward. Um, so how might the dynamics emerge? And I'm going to reel off a series of things that could happen and you ask yourself, please, is this happening? Is this, uh, is this plausible? Uh, and is it going on already? The first is that as conditions across the country continue to decline across a wide front, or perhaps just continue to fester uh, as they are, uh, ever larger number of Americans lose faith in the system's ability to deliver on the values it, it proclaims. Uh, and the system loses support. And that can eventually lead to a crisis of legitimacy, much as, it, much as the Great Depression did. Uh, meanwhile, we're going to almost certainly, in my judgment, experience uh, additional crises, uh, economic and environmental, and they're likely to grow more numerous and more fearsome. Uh, and that should lead progressives uh, of all stripes to coalesce, uh, to find their voice, to find their strength, uh, and to pioneer the development, um, further development, really, of a powerful set of ideas and proposals confirming that the path to a better world does indeed uh, exist. Demonstrations and protests multiply, occupy, Wisconsin State House, Tar Sands Pipeline, and a popular movement for pro-democracy reform and transformative change is born. At the local level, people and groups plant the seeds of change through a host of innovative initiatives that provide inspirational models, bringing, in a way, the future into the present. Uh, and, um, you know, with uh, all kinds of new types of corporations, public-private hybrids, profit not for profit hybrids, social enterprises, co-ops, uh, government enterprises, government involvement in companies. Uh, probably should have kept our role in some of these companies like General Motors. You know, uh, uh, come back to come back to that. But um, but um, and then sensing that the uh, way that things are moving. Uh, our political leaders finally uh, rise to the occasion uh, and support the growing movement for change and frame a compelling narrative or story that Bill Moyers and others have said, you know, is so, uh, so important to, to have a story of what's gone wrong and how we got here and uh, how we kept doing things that once were good and worked for us but then became counterproductive. Uh, and a movement broadens to become a major national force. Well, we don't know how these factors might come together, but they're all quite plausible, it seems to me, uh, developments uh, that could come together and, and drive real change. And when that happens, when the demand for real change comes, the strengthens and comes forward, uh, you can be sure that it'll be met with fierce opposition. And so this leads me to the point that Fritz made at the outset that, uh, you know, that the, the, the possibility of achieving any of these changes along any of these dozen dimensions uh, will depend mightily on the strength of the political movement that is built and the, and the, and the reforms that are being put in place to, to save our, our democrat, democracy from this creeping corporatocracy and, and plutocracy. Um, I want to uh, conclude by a few comments about the international uh, scene because I know that uh, many of you here are particularly interested in that as, and, and you should be. Uh, so let me elaborate a little bit on this theme. Um, the view that I take and is reflected in, in the book is that, you know, we have the U.S. posture in the world today reflects the radical imbalance. Uh, a hugely disproportionate focus on the military and on, you know, international economic issues and a tragic neglect, on the other hand, uh, of many of the most serious challenges that the world uh, now faces. Um, so let's focus first on the imbalance towards the, the military and what is called, uh, I think appropriately, the American empire. Um, consider consider the, uh, the sheer uh, size. You know, military defense spending today is higher than at any time in the Cold War. Uh, we spend 43% 40, of the world's total uh, defense spending is in our country. We spend more than something like the next 15 countries combined. Uh, on the military, 43% uh, of the world total. Um, 
if you add in not just defense spending, but uh, homeland security and the CIA and other things, you know, security spending broadly conceived like that is a trillion dollars annually in the country. Uh, that's a fourth of all federal spending and two-thirds of all discretionary spending. Two-thirds of all discretionary spending. Some one, I think it maybe it was Ezra Klein of the Washington Post said that you should think of our, 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 our government as an insurance company with an army. Because if you add up all the social insurance funding, the so-called entitlements, and the military spending, you have, you've got almost the whole budget. Uh, in 2010, the, uh, the last time I looked at it, the, the, the base structure report from the Pentagon uh, said that we had 662 military sites in 38 countries around the world. But people, that, that excludes a series of countries that they don't report on, including Saudi Arabia, uh, and of course Afghanistan, and so people have looked at hard at that and concluded that we have about a thousand military sites and bases around the world, some, some small, uh, some quite huge. Uh, so in, in effect, we garrison the world as no empire has ever, ever done. Um, well, that's only part of the story. We have 70% of the global arms business, sales. Um, in 2010, we had an estimated 13,000 special operations troops deployed in 75 countries. Huh. Uh, so we're on the ground in, with covert and clandestine operations in about 40% of the world's countries now. Uh, despite Eisenhower's warning about the military-industrial complex, uh, it is more powerful now than ever. Uh, the poster child, of course, is Lockheed Martin. Um, you know, uh, scores of billions of, of dollars in government contracts uh, annually, facilities in 46 states. That's the that's the strategic ploy. You get your, you know, you've got 46 <coughs> states in your, you know, senators and for 46 states in, in your pocket. Uh, mm -hmm. And and of course, uh, you may remember the famous Washington Post coverage in 2010. Uh, this alarming series about the size of America's anti-terrorism programs. Um, some, I quote, some 1,300 government organizations and 1,900 private companies work on programs related to counterterrorism. Can you imagine that? Homeland Security and Intelligence in some 10,000 locations across the United States. So, you know, I, I, whatever it's gained us, and there have been some gains, of course, uh, this national security state has also created a, a world of trouble for us and for others. It's led to a major assault on privacy and civil liberties, a serious distortion of our national politics uh, by the military-industrial complex, and the unfortunate consequences don't, uh, don't end there. Uh, Chalmers Johnson and <coughs> Andrew Basevich and others have stressed what, what they refer to as the rise of militarism uh, in the U.S. And they, they define militarism as the three, three, meaning three characteristics, the rise of a professional military class, uh, the adoption of policies in which military preparedness becomes the highest priority of the state. You, you notice, you know, what uh, the, this whole sequester thing is sort of the first thing they want to save is the military spending. And third, uh, the tendency to see uh, military action uh, as a solution to problems with there might be other solutions as well. As, as uh, Nicholas Kristof wrote one time, if you, know, if you have an armful of hammers, every problem looks like a nail. If you have a big <laughs> armful of military, every problem looks like it has a military solution. Um, and of course, one does end up in wars. Uh, and um, one thinks maybe of Iran in this context now, but I've been recently reading uh, three books with these titles, Resource Wars, Water Wars, and climate wars. Uh, so it could be that those areas uh, lead to more interventions uh, than we're imagining now. Um, another consequence of empire that uh, James Johnson and Gary Wills and Fritz Schwartz and, and others have th stressed is the threat uh, to our democracy. Um, a combination of huge standing armies, uh, almost continuous wars, and an ever-growing economic dependence on the military-industrial complex uh, has, you know, in a, as they say, effectively been 
destroying our republican structure of government in favor of an imperial uh, presidency. Um, and the final sorrow of empire uh, is something I think we've probably all experienced uh, personally, and, and that is the draining psychological burden uh, on U.S. citizens, on all of us, of the actions that we are taking around the world. Uh, you know, we, uh, it's easy to get depressed or engage in denial or forgetfulness uh, or even worse, the hardening of, of our spirit uh, when we see our own military and the CIA and U.S. contractors engaged in, in torture, uh, large killings of innocent civilians, murders, uh, the taking of body parts as souvenirs, renditions, drone assassinations, military detention without trial or rights, uh, collaboration with unsavory regimes, and, and more. Well, outside of the Pentagon of plenitude, uh, you know, the world is often festered without much help and sometimes harm from the United States. Uh, we, we badly neglected a whole series of uh, international challenges uh, outside of the security and economic spheres, uh, defaulted on our responsibilities on climate protection and other environmental needs, uh, badly underperformed in the development and humanitarian areas, and underinvested in major challenges like global population and transnational organized crime, and failed in fragile states, which Secretary Gates once said was the biggest security challenge that we face, water management and food supply, pandemic disease, clean energy, all areas that we've badly uh, uh, neglected. Um, so I would you know, argue that our economic and political life is infected with a bad case of militarization that in turn has led to a severe imbalance in the allocation of public and private resources among the many challenges that uh, America uh, faces. And I would add that you know, for those of you interested in the law, we are not party to most of the international agreements that the world has forged. Uh, we've thumbed our noses at the Convention on the Rights of the Child, the Convention on, against all forms of discrimination against women, uh, the Landmine Convention, the Criminal Court Convention, the uh, Kyoto Protocol for Climate, the Biodiversity Convention, the uh, Convention on uh, Persistent Organic Pollutants. We just don't participate. We don't. We haven't ratified them. We're not a member of these treaty regimes. Um, as as Fritz uh, <coughs> stressed, uh, if civilian, uh, you know, democratic control of the military is going to be meaningful, the, the wall of secrecy uh, that surrounds military and security affairs and, and pre prevents a, a serious dialogue and discussion of a lot of these issues has got to be breached and means found to encourage a robust uh, public debate. Congress and the courts should actually seriously enforce the war powers uh, power uh, meaningfully and uh, enforce it strictly. Uh, legislation should be required, uh, to be requiring a waiting period between military service and other public service. Um, Congress is, as Fritz has argued, it should be pressed into action to rein in the imperial presidency. Um, as he and uh, Aziz say in their, their great book, uh, executive unilateralism uh, that not only undermines the delicate balance of our Constitution but also lessens our human liberties and hurts vital counterterrorism campaigns. They conclude that Congress must act by enacting meaningful limiting legislation and by holding effective oversight hearings, but they caution that Congress will change its ways when voters start demanding. Uh, that it fulfill its constitutional mandate. And they conclude by observing, uh, at the beginning of the chain of democratic responsibility stands the people. And that, of course, points to the biggest question of all, uh, what are we, the people, going to do? Uh, in conclusion, I think that uh, in the end, it, it all comes down uh, to the American people. And the strong possibility, I would argue, that we still have it in us to use our freedom and our democracy in a powerful way to create something fine, uh, a reborn America for our children and grandchildren. But it won't be easy. 
and it won't be quick, and we better get started now because there are things that are closing down possibility, uh, closing down the possibility of America the possible. Thank you very much. Thank you.